Glory to Jesus Christ. Greetings, friends. My name is Father Robert Pipta, and I am the rector of the Byzantine Catholic Seminary in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Not long after my priestly ordination in 1994, my bishop assigned me to serve on church liturgical and music commissions. I remain on the Interparchial Liturgical Commission to this day, and over these past 25 years have learned a great deal from the expertise of the other members of these various commissions. Indeed, on my work on these commissions, I have learned, I'm sure, much, much more than I've actually been able to contribute to the work of the other members. Metropolitan William, who appoints each member of our seminary faculty, noted the importance of seminarians being trained in liturgy by those who are connected to the work and expertise of the liturgical commission. So I continue to serve as both commission member for the Metropolitan Church and as a practicum instructor here at BCS. In addition to my working with usually third and fourth year seminarians in these practicum courses, which attempt to enhance their capacity to function publicly in the liturgical roles of deacon and priest, a great joy of my service to the seminary is witnessing the fervor with which each seminarian and staff member strives to serve the liturgical services of the Byzantine Catholic Church with care and devotion. In 2006, a book was prepared by the Interparchial Liturgical Commission and the Interparchial Music Commission and approved by the U.S. Byzantine Catholic Metropolitan Church Council of Hierarchs to assist us in participating more fully in the Divine Liturgy. My goal in this and probably a second and third video, each which are to be called liturgical rubrics for the faithful, I want to unearth some frequently missed words of guidance that should lend to a more authentic, edifying, and nourishing celebration of the Divine Liturgy in the Byzantine Catholic Church. This is a pretty thick volume. If I turn to the end and the last page with text on it, I'm on page 467. There is a lot contained in this book and it can be overwhelming. Probably it gives primarily everything that is needed by a cantor or a choir that is leading the congregational singing in a parish. And that is how in the Carpatho-Ruthenian tradition of Byzantine Christianity, liturgical worship is to be celebrated with congregational singing, congregational participation. Those who attend the Divine Liturgy are not an audience while the bishop or the priest or the deacon serve as the performers. No, everybody is serving in the presence of God according to a particular role. And for many people, especially those gathered in the nave of the church, the role is to listen, to respond to the prayers and petitions of the priest and the deacon, to sing the hymns and to be filled with the word of God and to be nourished in the divine Eucharist. The book is to help us to do just that. Reading the book isn't our goal in celebrating the Divine Liturgy. Following page to page isn't absolutely necessary unless we need to, to make the proper responses. I would think as we find in the first part of the book, the standard responses that apply to every Divine Liturgy, at a certain point, we don't need the book anymore. We pretty much know how to sing Amen or Lord have mercy to you, O Lord, and some of the hymns that are sung over and over at every divine liturgy, Holy God, Holy, 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 the Our Father. These we probably know by heart, even if we've never tested ourselves, and we could probably sing them even without following the music, as long as we have a cantor or choir to guide us through the liturgical singing in our church. Most of the book, after we pass that first section, is 
made up of what are called the propers and the commons of the divine liturgy. These are the changing parts, the troparia, the contakia, the prokimena. And indeed, if we are going to sing along with those hymns, unless we have a very good memory, we probably need to know what page those are found on, put a ribbon there so it's easy for us to find, and sing along when those parts of the liturgy arise. These video presentations are really not to give an instruction in cantering. There are already very good resources in the church to do that, perhaps in your own parish or your eparchy. Affiliated with the seminary is the Metropolitan Cantor Institute, and they do a fabulous job through their website and courses, including online courses of training cantors and others who are interested in perfecting their liturgical singing and their understanding of the Carpatho Ruthenian chant tradition to give what is needed just, just for this purpose. The MCI is there for that. And in my videos here, I want to look at some other aspects of the liturgy that are found in the book, probably that are very often missed unless we sit down with the book like a novel and read it cover to cover. Perhaps some of you have a book like this available in your homes during this time of the COVID-19 pandemic. Some priests in those parishes where, where there are faithful who have returned to the celebration of the liturgy, and many have, and they've done so safely and confidently, the priests don't necessarily want the people sharing these books. So he might say, take these home with you, keep it, or borrow it for a while, and come back to the church and use the same book Sunday after Sunday. Perhaps if we do have one of these more readily available to us, we can understand some of the details I want to bring forth in these videos. We begin always with what is most important about liturgy. It is prayer. Prayer is union with God. It's relationship with God. It's communication with God. It's communion with God. It's all of that. The Divine Liturgy in particular is our greatest prayer. It's the summit of all of our prayer. And the reception of the Eucharist is the summit of all the holy mysteries in the church. Our real intimate participation in the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we want our celebration of the Divine Liturgy to be worthy of that great goodness of God who gives himself to us in his son, our Lord Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so, again, the liturgy isn't coming to the church and opening up a book and keeping our, our face glued into the text. We use the book when we need, when we don't have parts memorized, when we don't know what comes next in the liturgy, to help us, to guide us like a signpost. But ultimately, our celebration of the liturgy should have us experiencing what's around us in the church. The iconography, the smells, the sounds, what's in the sanctuary, the holy table, the gospel book, the tabernacle, the ritual, the actions of the priest and the deacon and the altar servers, the readings, the listening, being nourished by the word, and then participating in the sacrifice of praise and in the reception of the Divine Eucharist. So first and foremost, we want to recognize that the Divine Liturgy is our celebration of the presence of God in our lives, and Christ is present at the Liturgy, and He guides us, and He nourishes us in what the Divine Liturgy seeks to accomplish. The formal title of this book is the Divine Liturgies of our Holy Fathers, John Chrysostom and Basil the Great. We actually celebrate two divine Eucharistic liturgies in the Byzantine Christian tradition, that of John Chrysostom, which is most commonly celebrated, and that of Basil the Great, which is celebrated on great festal occasions and on the Sundays of the Great Fast. In my focuses of these videos, the distinction between the liturgies really will not come into play, so I'm not going to focus 
on those distinctions. Beneath the title of this book is Responses and Hymns Set to the Carpathian Plain Chant. Primarily, this book helps us to sing the responses and hymns of the Divine Liturgy. Its complexity needs to be understood by cantors and anybody who leads the singing in the church, but it also can be appreciated by others who want to more fully participate in the Divine Liturgy. As we turn to the content page, we see that the first part of the book contains the ordinary of the liturgy. These are the unchanging sections of the liturgy, at least as far as text goes. There are a variety of melodies, and that adds some complexity to what sometimes can be seen as a rather terrifying book with so many pages and so much music. But hopefully, if I can guide you in these videos into some of the details of the book, it will be a little bit less scary for us and something that can actually help us when needed and not get in our way when not needed. The second section of the book has the propers of the liturgy, those hymns that are specific to Sundays and the feast from Easter all the way through the great fast of the following year. And then we have the immovable feasts, those feasts that are always on a particular day of the year, like the Feast of the Nativity on the 25th of December, or the Feast of the Dormition on the 15th of August. There are also commons. There are certain hymns that can be used for various saints, depending on that saint's classification. Is the saint a martyr, or a venerable, or an apostle, or a prophet? Well, depending on that classification, we can apply the name of the saint to a particular hymn, and that is called a common. There are also some liturgies for special intentions. Liturgies for the dead would be one example of this. And then there are some pages given to special services, like the prayer service for the deceased called a panahita, or a general malevin for the living. There are some paraliturgical hymns, or actually they're liturgical hymns that can be used in a paraliturgical way. And then there is a glossary at the end, which is well worth a read if you have never done so. One of the first points I would like to make about this faithful's book, as it is sometimes called, it's also sometimes called a pew book for those churches that have pews and they keep these, these books readily available to the faithful in the pews is that it represents when it was approved and published in 2006, a change from divine liturgy as it was celebrated previous to that time. It has taken some time for various eparchies and parishes to adapt to this book. There are musical settings that are different than they were previously. There are some translations, English translations that have changed. There are some different directives regarding posture as well, and some other more general changes in the way we celebrate the liturgy. But the basics of the liturgy and the essentials of the divine liturgy have not changed. And we might be thrown a little bit by what we're not used to when something changes, but we must keep in mind that liturgy has organically progressed. It's evolved since the very first liturgies that came from our Lord instituting the Eucharist and giving his Holy Spirit to the apostles to do this, celebrate the Eucharist in memory of him. And then they're laying on hands for those who would become the bishops of the church and they're laying on hands of the priests who serve us on an ordinary basis. Um, from those earliest times of the church, there has been a gradual progression in the celebration of the liturgy. Yes, in the Byzantine Christian tradition, 
at least for the, the last 600 years or so, there's been relatively little change to the divine liturgy. But the kind of changes that were experienced with the publication of this book in 2006 are considered relatively small when it comes to liturgical matters. And I will try to focus on some of those when we go through the book. One of the special additions to this particular volume of the Divine Liturgy are prayers of preparation. And these begin on page four. I would encourage anybody who comes to the church for the celebration of the Divine Liturgy to pray these prayers quietly, unless they are prayed publicly in the church before the liturgy. If your church celebrates one of the small hours, like the third hour, or matins immediately before the Divine Liturgy, and if you've not arrived for these services, which is a great thing to do, you arrive as they are being prayed, it's still acceptable as you settle in in the church to take up your faithful's book and to pray these prayers. Sometimes a reader or a cantor is assigned to pray these prayers of preparation before the liturgy, and they can be chanted or they can be read in a spoken manner. There are the specific prayers of preparation on pages eight through 10, and I recall when I served in parishes and we had these prayers available to us, we would simply pray one or two of them. We would have a selection of them before the Divine Liturgy in an effort to not have the prayers take too long and to have as many people as possible benefit from them immediately before the Divine Liturgy. You might do the same thing yourself. As I already went through the content page, you might notice there's not a lot of detail in the pages that are given. And there is a book specifically for cantors. It's called The Cantor's Companion. And this book contains, and there also um, have some of these books that have inserted in a very detailed content page. But it is so detailed, the content page can actually be very overwhelming and not be all that helpful. So what I have always encouraged cantors to do is take a few moments, and our men do this here in the seminary, five minutes before the liturgy begins, they, they get the faithful's attention in the church and they are specific about where to find the changeable parts, the propers of the divine liturgy. And they encourage us to use the ribbons that are given and to mark the pages so that when we get to that portion of the liturgy, um, unless we've memorized most of the first part and we don't even need the first part of the book, we can turn to the needed pages and follow along. Sometimes cantors will also say we're going to use the A melodies or the B melodies or the C melodies uh, based on what their choice is for the hymns where there are variants of musical melodies given in the book. When we come to page 11, we begin seeing here the public part of the Divine Liturgy. And the first part of the Divine Liturgy is the Anarxis. This is the liturgy of petitions, psalmody, and refrains, or troparia, that form the first portion of the liturgy that leads us up to the liturgy of the word. And again, this video is called Liturgical Rubrics for the Faithful. And here we have our first rubrics on page 11 at the top. The faithful stand when the preparatory rites are completed and the great insensation of the church takes place. The preparatory rites here mentioned are those that are performed by the clergy before the priest and deacon enter the sanctuary to celebrate the liturgy. They offer prayers of preparation before the icon screen. They bow their head down to the faithful asking for forgiveness and they enter the sanctuary and venerate the holy table. And then they vest. And then at a side table in the sanctuary, they prepare the bread and the wine for the celebration 
of the Eucharist. These are the preparatory rites referenced here. And sometimes these are performed even before you might arrive at the church and the priest might then make himself available for confession, which is a very important way of preparing for the liturgy. Not necessarily every single divine liturgy we attend and receive Eucharist at, but on a regular basis, confession is an important preparation for liturgy. But once everything is ready and the public portion of the liturgy is about to begin, the whole church is incensed. And there's a hierarchy to the insensation. It begins always with the holy table, where, where the Lord is enthroned in his word, the gospel book, which is placed on the holy table, and in his body and blood in the Eucharist, which are contained in the tabernacle, which is on the holy table. This is incensed first. And then the apsidal image or the apsidal icon, the, the large icon, very often of the mother of God and ever Virgin Mary, sometimes of our Lord Jesus Christ, but the icon that is on the back wall of the sanctuary. And then other icons in the sanctuary might be incensed. And then the deacon usually, but if there's no deacon, the priest then comes out of the sanctuary and incenses the icon screen. And then he goes around the church and incenses other icons in the nave of the church. And then finally, the faithful are incensed. We do not need to make the sign of the cross upon ourselves when we are incensed by the bishop, priest, or deacon. When we are blessed by a bishop or priest, we do cross ourselves in the carpatho ruthenian tradition but we do not cross ourselves when we are incensed. Once this incensation has taken place, the holy doors are opened, usually by the deacon, and the liturgy begins. So now that we are actually into the liturgy, I will conclude this part one of my video presentation and join you back on page 11 in part two. Thank you for listening.